Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Rick Trainer. I'm principal of King's College London, and it's uh, my enormous uh, pleasure and privilege to welcome you to this event, which is co-sponsored by the Kofi Annan Foundation, by UNA UK, and by the Conflict Security and Development Research Group uh, of King's College London. Um, it's wonderful to have this uh, distinguished uh, audience assembled. I'm assured by those who know that when tickets were made available for this event that to say that they sold like hotcakes would be an understatement. They were evidently gone within the half hour. Um, and I'm not surprised, but it, it, it's very pleasing to have you all with us. Some of you, of course, are either um, uh, staff or students of King's College of London, but many of you are not, which gives me just a, a very slender uh, opportunity to engage in a little bit of advertising for my institution. Um, founded in 1829, these premises, uh, not this room in its current condition, of course, opened in 1831. Part of the University of London, but these days a very decentralized entity. King's has been awarding its own degrees for the last six years. We have about 26,000 students, about 7,000 employees, and the system of uh, world rankings that we like the best because it shows us in the best light um, recently had us as 19th uh, internationally, that is, in, in the world. And we uh, pursue teaching and research across a, a very wide range uh, of <laughs> subjects from the arts and humanities through the social sciences, natural and mathematical sciences, law, and a whole range of uh, biomedical sciences and health disciplines. But within that, international affairs um, is a long-standing and brightly shining uh, strong suit uh, at King's College London. Uh, we have a variety of undergraduate and postgraduate um, uh, qualifications being pursued. And we have in our Department of War Studies, a department which for now for more than uh, 50 years has been pursuing not just the study of war, as the name suggests, but a whole variety of other related subjects, nicely summed up, I think, by the name of the research group that I gave before, conflict, <coughs> security, uh, and development. And that wide-ranging approach to international affairs, um, led in this case by Professor uh, Mats Berdahl, the head of the group, is, I think, a very appropriate um, uh, transition to the event that we're hosting uh, here today. Um, uh, one that's uh, conscious, of course, of conflict, but also dedicated to its uh, resolution uh, and prevention. Um, this is, in a way, a family occasion for King's College London, in that uh, both of our, the major participants I'm about to give way to have a special connection, I'm very pleased to say, to King's College London. So Secretary General uh, Annan, among his many, many honors, um, uh, received an honorary degree from King's in 2008 when we were very privileged to have his commemoration lecture, another occasion which sold out within the half hour. And it's an absolute delight to have you back with us, Mr. Adam, uh, this afternoon. And the person who's going to be, um, in the most elegant sense of the term, interrogating the former <laughs> Secretary General, um, Sir Jeremy Greenstock, uh, is also, uh, in addition to his many distinctions, um, a former UK ambassador uh, to the UN, uh, special representative uh, to Iraq, director of the Ditchley Foundation, and now uh, chairman of the UN Association UK. In addition to all those things, I'm pleased to say he's an honorary fellow of King's College London, uh, a tie we've had to him since 2006. So that's more than enough for me. We're absolutely delighted that you're all here, and in particular that our two special participants are here. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Jeremy Greenstock and ask you to join me in welcoming him. Uh, thank you, Principal. Welcome, everybody, uh, to this wonderful special event. 
uh, with King's College and UNA working closely together. Uh, it's great to be back in this college, uh, Rick. Thank you so much for your welcome. And thanks to your colleague, Professor Mats Berdal, the Professor for Security and Development at King's College, uh, for helping to bring this together with um, my team at UNA UK. Before I get into the business of uh, the afternoon, could I please let you all know that this is an open event, will be recorded. Please, could you turn your phones off and not use flash photography, uh, apart from the official photographers here. Uh, it is, in that sense, um, a, uh, an open event. So um, please make sure that you follow those guidelines. Secretary General, it's wonderful uh, to have you back in the confines of King's College London and in the arms of UNA UK, which you have so warmly supported uh, throughout your various distinguished jobs. Uh, this is a very important occasion uh, in two senses for both uh, your book that's coming out, We the Peoples, the collection uh, of your marvelous speeches through your period as Secretary General. Uh, and it's the start of the lead up uh, for UNA UK to their major uh, biennial event, the UN Forum, which takes place uh, at Central Hall, Westminster, on the 28th of June. Uh, and this is the start of the season leading up to that event. And we very much want the substance of this afternoon to feed into some of the debate uh, that will take place in Central Hall uh, on that Saturday uh, in late June. Kofi Annan was the seventh Secretary General of the United Nations, 1996 to 2007, uh, and the first and the only one so far to have risen to that position from out of the ranks of the UN system itself. Uh, in which he served for 44 years uh, of his public career. He is also chair of the Kofi Annan Foundation, uh, which does uh, marvelous work across the world with a special focus uh, on Africa. I learnt when I was there for my five years at the UN, totally within Mr. Annan's Secretary Generalship, what an important difference he was making to the resetting of the UN's priorities during his term, which is often referred to under the name of reform, but international institutions are very hard to reform. They've got to be made to work to their full potential and capacity, and that is what Kofi Annan strove and succeeded uh, in doing to make the international system more effective and to make the only global institution a real part uh, of that system. He was a constant advocate for human rights, the rule of law, the Millennium Development Goals, and for Africa, which I learned took up two thirds of the work uh, of the UN Security Council. And he sought to bring the organization closer not just to governments or even to parliaments, but to global citizens uh, by forging ties with civil society, the corporate sector, uh, and with other partners uh, across the world. Since uh, leaving the UN uh, at the beginning of, 90, of 2007, uh, Kofi Annan has not ceased to uh, give his all to international affairs. In early 2007, he set up the Kofi Annan Foundation to promote better global governance and strengthen the capacity of peoples to, to achieve a fairer and more secure world. And the foundation works to counter new threats to security and peace and supports his preventive diplomacy and mediation activities. One of those quickly came to light in 2008 when he led the African Union's panel of eminent African personalities in addressing, above all, the difficult situation 
in Kenya. And there are many other instances of the work that he's done continuing the special mission that he took on as Secretary General. He's the founding chairman of the Alliance for a Green Revolution uh, in Africa. He's an active member and now chairman of the Elders Group. And he's a board member, a patron, or an honorary member of a whole range of organizations, including the UN Foundation. And you will already, most of you, have read uh, his first published book, his memoir, Interventions, A Life in War and Peace, which was published two years ago. I will now uh, invite Mr. Annan up to the stage. We are going to have uh, a conversation about uh, the book, uh, the UN, current events, the link between the past and the future, <clears throat> and we shall bring in uh, some of you who have submitted as requested questions before the event, uh, and the questioners will be called out uh, to stand up and take the microphone and ask their question, and if there are follow-up comments from the questioner, uh, I would like to take those, uh, and we will vary between the stage and the audience as we go along, but the questions are all uh, pre-submitted and pre-chosen. Uh, and at the end of this section of the afternoon, at around uh, three, uh, um, 4.30, I'm getting my time right, 4.30, uh, I will have brought uh, onto the stage Edward Mortimer, who um, collaborated with Kofi Annan very closely in the writing uh, of these speeches that we're talking about this afternoon. And then we'll move into uh, a book signing half hour in another room, the details of which I will explain to you uh, at the time that we get to that point. But I'd like you all now, please, to give a warm welcome to the former seventh Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Kofi Annan. Now, Kofi, you've got a pretty knowledgeable audience here. Uh, they are getting already into your book, which I have in front of me. Uh, they will want to ask you some quite searching questions about where you think our only global institution has gone. It's very difficult to uh, say more than you said in these speeches mm -hmm. about the trend of events. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have now been away from the United Nations for seven years now. Uh, and I think you'll get some questions about the trend of that organization and where you think it's going to go. But one of the things you say in your speeches and you say in this book is that human rights were at the very heart yeah of the UN's work, linked with everything. You draw that out in the five lessons that you've learned from your experience at the UN. And yet, the principles of human rights were very difficult to agree and apply globally because the UN covers so many different cultures and so many different political interests and objectives. Do you think we are beginning to gain traction on a universal acceptance of a single standard of human rights? And how is it that the UN can go on implementing, with its various organs, that very important core work? We, we are gaining traction in the sense that uh, many more people are now familiar with the universal, uh, universality of human rights. And you have many active groups pushing for human rights. And I also believe that, um, actually I believe it, I don't know if all, everybody does, but I think many people are beginning to accept that democracy is more than elections. We have 
had a tendency to think when you have elections, you go through crisis, you have elections, you are on the road to establishing democracy. And yet, to build a healthy, strong democracy, I believe you need three pillars. You need to have peace and stability, you need development, and you need rule of law and respect for human rights. Because I don't think you can have long-term development without stability and peace. Nor can you have long-term stability without development, looking after the welfare of the people. But no country can long remain prosperous without respect for rule of law and human rights. And I think that third pillar is extremely important. And I think the importance of that third pillar is beginning to dawn on people when you look around the world. And in fact, we talked of the Arab Spring and Arab Awakening. If you take Tunisia, for example, if before the Arab Awakening I had asked people, what do you think of Tunisia? I would have had great country, very stable, and high GDP growth. Nobody will mention the third pillar. And yet it was the absence of that third pillar that led to the explosion. And, and this message, I think, is beginning uh, uh, to sink in. We just had uh, elections in the biggest democracy in the world, the Indian uh, uh, elections. And the, the rise of civil liberties was very much part of the elections and what led to the results that we saw. And the input into this subject that the member states themselves are contributing, particularly through the Human Rights Council in Geneva. Uh, it, has that been a worthy successor to the previous uh, Human Rights Committee of the UN, where there was a lot of argument about the performance of states who were in the chair? I think we are making progress. The, under the commission, I saw two groups. Two groups that came to Geneva each year. One group determined to condemn the other, the other determined to defend itself. And when they locked horns at the end of it, you ask yourself, but where is the individual whose rights we are supposed to protect? It sounded as if we had forgotten the individuals who were more interested in locking horns. What the council has done, which can be extremely helpful, is the re review of all uh, records of all countries, in effect arguing that no country has a perfect human rights system or record. Some have better systems we can learn from. So by reviewing the human rights performance of each country, you learn, you get people to engage seriously, and they know that uh, it's going to be their turn next year, so they have to be serious in, in the discussions that you have. And I think that has been helpful. Uh, you also have the rapporteur system, which I think has served the UN and the countries uh, well. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. I know sometimes governments are surprised by the members who are voted on to the council. But we live in the real world. And if we want to improve the human rights record of all countries, we should have some of the uh, bad ones also in the system, and, and, and that's a way to improve them. Yeah. You, you say in your speech on the human rights, hmm. uh, I think it was in 2006, hmm. uh, in your last month, hmm. in fact, hmm. that you looked to three areas in particular hmm. to take a lead on implementing the principles hmm. that we talk about right. in human yeah. rights. Africa, civil society, and women. Uh, do you think those three areas are picking up that challenge? Yeah, I, I can talk from direct experience. Uh, it is happening, but when I was in Kenya, I got into Kenya and decided that by then, over a thousand people had been killed and the killing was going on. In the end, 1,300 people were killed, 650 people were uprooted from their homes. And I decided I wasn't going to work with the governments to 
to rearrange the political chairs and that we needed to have a deeper reform. And to do that, we needed to work with civil society and the people. So from the government's, in my meeting with the government, I convened civil society, women's groups, religious groups, private business groups, and told them, Kenya is on the brink. We need to work together to save it. And you have a role to play. Don't leave it to the politicians alone. They will not do it, or they will not do it the right way. And so whichever agreement we sign, we will not keep it behind closed doors. I will release it immediately to you. And you have to make sure it's implemented, maintain the pressure. Most of the leaders of the civil society groups were women. They showed incredible courage. They came to the meetings, organized with the opposition papers, and really pushed for reform. Today, Kenya, despite all the problems, has perhaps one of the most progressive constitutions on the continent. Mm -hmm. It came out of this process. Yeah. And I couldn't have done the work we did without them, without the women's groups, without uh, civil society. Yes, and I think other groups around Africa have watched what has happened in Kenya, uh, and they are strengthening their civil society groups. The governments, the leaders, the politicians are not necessarily sympathetic to civil society. Uh, as I travel around the world, you often get comments from governments. Whose agenda are they carrying out? Who's paying them? Whom are they working for? Who gave them the mandate? And uh, they are all failed politicians organizing themselves in civil. You know, they are not very, uh, but they, ha they are making a difference. And I think we are seeing a re development of robust civil society, which is extremely important for Africa, for democracy and respect for human rights. That's the only way you can put pressure on the leaders and end impunity. Let's, let's or oh, you cannot see my face. You can, you can okay. You, is this better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Thank you for that. But you can hear me though. Yeah. Okay. Let's start the questions from the audience. When I call a name, please give your name and affiliation if you'd like to, and put your question when the microphone reaches you. I'm going to start with Steph Siddle. Thank you, Sir Jeremy. Um, I'm Steph Siddle, former intern at UNA UK. Mr. Renan, um, I wanted to ask, what has been the biggest change that you have seen in the world since you were Secretary General? That's, a, that's an interesting first question. <laughs> yeah. No, it, there, ha, there has been quite a few changes. I think one of the, I'm going back to when I started. I, I hope you don't, you're not referring to the changes that has taken place since I stepped down. Yeah, I, I think uh, in a way, Sir Jeremy referred to some of them. The engagement with civil society, with the private sector, and the sort of partnerships which have emerged today, which allows the UN to work in concert with civil society, with the private sector, with governments and parliamentarians. Um, I think we tend to underestimate it, but it has had a, a real uh, impact. Some of the achievements that the UN has made and is going to be making wouldn't be possible without a civil society. And in some situations, the private sector has had incredible impact. I'll give you one example in the area of HIV AIDS. Dr. Gru Brundtland and Peter Piot, who was head in the, uh, Gru Brundtland was World Health, Peter Piot was UN AIDS. We were all very worried about how we get treatment to the poor. The antiretroviral treatment had come, but was very expensive. 
it was about $15,000 per, per person per year. There was no way the poor could have access to this. And uh, we began cracking our heads, how do we help the poor? How can you go and tell the poor that we know you're sick, medication is available that can save you, but because you don't have money, it's a death sentence. So what we did was con I convened seven chairmen of the largest pharmaceutical companies in Amsterdam, and we put the problem to them that you need to work with us to get this medication to the poor. They were very hesitant at the beginning. One of them said, I don't even know why I came to this meeting. Uh, we'll be accused of price uh, fixing. And I said, price fixing is when you collude to maximize profits. We brought you here to lose money. We want you to cut your prices. And at that time, in fact, they were suing Mandela in South African court because he had threatened to use compulsory licensing to produce a medication for his people. So I said, I told him, I don't know who your special, your communication advisors are. I'm not one. But if you go and see Mandela in South Africa on an issue like HIV AIDS, if you lose, you lose and lose. If you win, you lose and lose and lose. And so you better find a way of resolving this out of court, which they eventually did. But they reduced the cost of the medication quite drastically, and some of it in a very pain, which prevented mother-to-child transmission, which was the, the, uh, the really the, the worst of all transmissions. They were given the medication away free in, in Southern African region, Botswana and others. And with that action, they really made contribution and saved lives. In fact, it was better than giving us money. But we could only do it because by then we had engaged um, the private sector. Before then, we were at arm's length with them. So a, a lot has happened. And I think what is also important is that the public and civil society, by and large, realize the importance of the UN, but there's lots of work that the UN has to do. In some situations, we've allowed expectations to rise very, very high, where, and create expectations that we couldn't possibly manage, we couldn't possibly succeed, and then we get knocked for failure. Yeah. Was that the program, Kofi, the AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis program, for which that, you raised an enormous amount, amount of money. It, yes. It gave you the most confidence That's good. that a program of that scale could, could actually happen. be done yes. and would make a That's difference. That's good. That's about the time we launched the Global Fund uh, to fight AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. And over the period, we've raised over $22, $25 billion to help uh, the poor. In fact, when I started the program, I I expected five billion dollars, yes. but we've now into uh, much, much more. Twenty-five billion dollars have been raised, and it saved lots of lives. Yeah. And, and not only were the private sector engaged, but civil society became also very active. And for the company directors, who at the beginning were hesitant, I had incredible encounters with them. I would meet chairman of these companies at the World of Australia at an event, and they would say, Mr. Secretary General, our workers love this program. They are happy that we are engaged and we are doing good. And then the young ones would approach me and say, Mr. Secretary General, maintain the pressure on the chairman and the board, <laughs> which was really a wonderful way of working. Yes. Let's have a second question from Roger Hallam, please. Put your hand up. There he is. Um, Roger Hallam, uh, Chair of the London Southeast Region of uh, United Nations Association UK. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, um, I'd like to ask you a question about the broad picture at the present time. Um, some are likening the current uh, blockage at the UN Security Council on key issues, such as uh, Syria or Ukraine. Uh, to a new Cold War. Uh, what is your own view as to the main tensions 
um, in the current international in, in current international relations. Thank you. Yeah. We are going through a, a very difficult uh, period, and the phrase uh, Third Cold War has been raised often. I hope we are not headed uh, that way. Um, I would want to see a situation where there's serious, quiet dialogue between the major, major powers. I personally think they are talking too much publicly, accusing each other and pointed fingers, and that makes sometimes uh, coming to an agreement uh, or understanding very uh, difficult. I hope we are not headed for a third Cold War. Um, I think the situation in Ukraine is difficult and complex, but I will give you my own uh, view. I, I have a sense that, first of all, we should have anticipated some of the problems we are facing uh, today. Um, I think the developments at Maidan Square got carried away, uh, uh, and some other politicians got carried away, because I, the Russians who are next door and their neighbors could simply, I'm not defending the Russians, but we should have known they would simply not allow Crimea, for example, to go with their fleet and all that, that there will be a reaction. Some of us are old enough to remember how the U.S. reacted when the Russian missiles appeared in Cuba. And that was 90 miles away with a sea in between. And this is on the air border. My sense is Putin and the Russians have to understand that a destabilized Ukraine is not in their interest. It will cause lots of problems for them, and they have enough already. I believe Ukraine should be a bridge. There shouldn't be a tug of war over Ukraine trying to pull it to the west or the east. Whoever succeeds cannot expect things to be calm. If you pull it to the west, there will be constant problems from the Russian side and vice versa. And I would want to see a situation where Ukraine lives peacefully with both sides, the sort of relationship we've seen with Norway, I mean, or Finland. Finland, Finland is a better example, where they are in uh, the, the Union, but not in NATO, and have very good relations with the Russians, and there has been no controversy, and I hope that is the direction people would want to go. And I think uh, the West and the Russian can make a common cause and stabilize uh, Ukraine. I have not given up, and I don't think a Cold War uh, is, is necessary. The Russians have made some moves, which perhaps Putin feels puts him in a strong position, but it doesn't mean that uh, he's going to have it all his way. Uh, a destabilized Ukraine can create lots of problems for him, and I suspect yes. he understands that, he, he knows that. Uh, what uh, is also unfortunate is the developments in other regions, whether it's Syria or Africa, where the regional powers do not play their role. When I look at the situation in Syria, which I was involved with, you cannot resolve the Syrian crisis unless the regional powers work effectively with the Security Council. By the regional powers, I mean Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey. And of course, now that things are improving a bit, Egypt would insist on being one of those regional powers that has to work with the international community to stabilize uh, Syria because they, they all have interests. Uh, we see almost proxy war going on in Syria, and it doesn't serve anyone's uh, interest. Um, it's interesting. We used to complain a lot about proxy wars funded and encouraged by US and Russia. Now we are seeing proxy wars 
being undertaken by regional powers, you know, uh, in, in, in their regions. And uh, as I look around, you have countries which are more afraid of the regional powers than the superpowers, because the superpowers are far away, they are not as close enough, and the regional powers can play a very disruptive role in any country when they decide to. Perhaps it's a moment um, on Syria to, to pay tribute not only to your own mm -hmm. amazing efforts, mm -hmm. beginning of that conflict, yeah. to find a solution, but to those of Ambassador Lakhdar Brahim, yeah. who's been one of your greatest uh, yeah. colleagues in trying to deal with difficult political situations. You both were unable to find a basis for political yeah. compromise. Do you despair of political compromise in Syria? What, when does the moment for yeah. another political push come? Yeah, yeah it, the president is going ahead with the elections, which unsurprisingly he would announce he's won. And, and, and that uh, 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 creates a problem as to whether you can go ahead with a, a, a new Geneva round. My own view is that one should quietly create a task, a, co a coalition, a core group, a core group which would include the permanent members of the Security Council and at least the four regional powers, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Egypt, and Turkey, to really come up with a program and make a common cause and say this is how we are going to uh, resolve this issue. And this is what I tried to do with Geneva 1. That paragraph in the communique that said what is required is a transitional government with full authority, uh, with full authority was to get everyone to rally. Uh, the Russians signed on, the Americans, everybody, but I could not get Saudi Arabia and Iran to attend that meeting. Iran was ready. The Saudis said they found it difficult to sit with the Iranians, and I couldn't get the Americans to deliver and or press the Saudis to come. So in the end, both of them were not there. Has the situation changed with the political change in Iran? And after all, the Saudi foreign minister has now invited his opposite yeah. number from Iran to visit, is there another chance? Do you think? I think we should work on it. I think it's time to try and see if we can bring them together. Because if you don't get them together, I recall with a six-point plan, when we got a cessation of hostilities, and you can go back and check the record on the 12th of April, we said all guns must cease fire. And it was quiet. Both sides stopped fighting. And I started, and I had been talking to the leaders in the region to help to pressure them to uh, honor the cessation of hostilities. And it was interesting. Some would tell me they have to defend themselves. The others say, well, if they stop fighting, what will the terrorists do? And they wouldn't help. Yeah. You know, they were not ready. But uh, because at that point, everybody thought military victory was possible and they were going to win. I think there's more realism now. And so with an effort, if we can put together that core group, we should really be able to then bring the Syrian parties to the table on the understanding that those pulling the strings would uh, work with the mediator. Yeah. Could we have a question please from Simingis Campbell? Mingus Campbell, House of Commons. Uh, my question is, I suppose, partly related to Syria. And it's this, uh, what is your assessment of the current effectiveness of the doctrine of the responsibility to protect? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I had a lot to do with that doctrine and I, I, I believe in it, but I think uh, it had a bit of a setback uh, with Libya. You know, you know, you would recall the Russians and the Chinese did not veto the resolution on Libya. 
uh, they, like other member states, had accepted the responsibility to protect. But it became very clear to me when I was handling Syria that they felt really bruised by what happened in Libya. Both the Russians and the Chinese felt that the mandate was misapplied and stretched, uh, arguing that they did not veto the resolution because they accepted the principle that people should be held. But we're shocked to see how quickly the resolution morphed or was turned into regime change. Uh, and I think we are going to have a difficulty getting them to agree to another resolution based on responsibility uh, to protect. In fact, in Syria, I discuss specifically arms embargo. The both countries saw it as a beginning of a slippery slope. Another Libya, they wouldn't buy it, they wouldn't uh, agree. But the fact that we have not been able to intervene in Syria doesn't mean we cannot intervene where we can. There will be other situations which will not be as complex and hopefully neither the Russians or the Chinese would veto it. I think, in fact, one of the perhaps most effective application of the doctrine was what happened in Kenya. Mm -hmm. We never talked of force. Mm -hmm. We had the support of all organizations from uh, Sharma here with the Commonwealth, European Union, the US. Everybody supported our work. The US was very strong. In fact, at one stage in the negotiations, President Bush and Condi Rice were in Tanzania. So I called President Bush, I said, we are at a critical stage. Could um, Condi join me and give these people a message? She came. And there were a couple of Kenyans who were plain spoilers, political leaders. The US suspended their visas and made it clear that the suspension is not only their individual visas, it affected their families. If children are steady in the US, they may have to leave and wives cannot go and shop. And uh, other governments were thinking of it. And of course, without releasing the names, everybody went around saying, who is next? What's happening? And a, a whole series of diplomatic and other pressures we got the situation turned around, never mentioning the use of force. And, and this is really perhaps the most effective way one should uh, look at the responsibility to protect. If you had tried to apply the <clears throat> determined principles that you applied in Kenya, in Libya under Colonel Gaddafi, mm -hmm. it might have exhausted even your patience no, to, I, to, to get to a result. No, that you I, have to fit it to the sun. No, that, that I agree. Each, each, each uh, crisis has its own peculiarities. I was just telling you the attitude of the Russians and the Chinese. Let's take Libya, for example. If when we saw the tanks rolling towards Benghazi, with the mandate of the Security Council, NATO had bombed the tanks and said, it's, it's a back off. We can go much further. Don't declare war on your own people. What would have happened? Will the Russians and the Chinese embrace the responsibility to protect? I don't know. But they really thought that it went too far when Gaddafi was thrown, trapped in the gutter and the ditch. Uh, I, I hold no brief for Gaddafi. I know what he was capable of, and the people had to uh, be protected. But the people also would ask a question. If you came to protect us, and you have bombed the tanks, knowing what Gaddafi is capable of, why do we do you leave us with him? Yes. This is the other question. Yes. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a tough one. I always thought that the <clears throat> Russians were constrained on Libya they were. by the fact that the Arab League were not taking the, the regional organization Position, yeah. pronounced, mm -hmm. which they don't often. Do you think 
that the time of the regional organisations has come that they need to take on more responsibility from the universal mm -hmm. centre of the UN. Yeah. Are, they, yeah. are they strong enough to do that? I think it depends on the region. Uh, the regional organisations have weaknesses. Uh, often it is extremely difficult to get them to agree to take action in a neighbouring country. The, I mean, take ASEAN, for example, is very, very reluctant to get involved in the politics of neighboring country. Uh, and I lived through this when we were handed East Timor. You were involved, you went to East Timor. We needed a force to help protect the people in East Timor. I managed to convince Prime Minister Howard of Australia to lead the force. He said he would lead the force but we needed to put a force together. He didn't want Australians to be alone there. I called uh, Mahatia, I called Indonesia, I called Thailand, Philippines. They all say, well, we see what is happening. We will be prepared to participate, but you should get permission from the Indo uh, Indonesians. You should get permission from the Indonesian president. And that was an incredible period for me because I was working both ends of the, uh, of the day. When we ended in New York, it was morning in, in Indonesia, so I'll be on the phone with the, the Prime Minister, uh, Abibi. And we went back and forth, and he was being misled by his own people. Yes. He kept, you know the story, he kept saying, we are not destroying East Timor. We are not uh, attacking the Timorese. It's Indonesians who have lived there and have to leave, who do not want to leave their properties, their cars, and, and they are destroying their own property before they left. I said, Mr. Prime Minister, it's not true. We went back and forth. Uh, in the end, he agreed that a force can come in to assist, not against his will, and not as an imposition uh, force. Then all the other countries came in. You know, they, they, they allowed their troops to join the force. Yes. Uh, but if you have crisis and you're going through this sort of thing, people will be... Uh, sorry. It was the Security Council mission, which I exactly. saw, that took General Wiranto, the That's good. Yeah. to Dili and showed him the lies that he was being told to by his own troops. Yeah, to and the embarrassment led to the release of, of East Timor. Yes, it's, it's true. Good combined effort. Let's have... A further question from Richard Kaplan, please. Here we go. Richard Kaplan, Professor of International Relations at the University of Oxford. You mentioned the United States a few moments ago. And during your tenure as Secretary General, your relations with the United States were at times fraught, to put it mildly. I'm wondering what lessons you draw from those experiences mm. for effective stewardship of the United Nations. Yeah. I, th I think uh, we have to start on the assumption that any Secretary General of the UN would one time or the other run into difficulties with one of the big powers, and it's likely to be the US because we are there. <laughs> We, 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 we are there, and one should be prepared uh, to, uh, to engage them. What is interesting here is uh, when the Secretary General is being attacked or gets into trouble with the U.S., you don't hear from the member states whose agent you are. They will tell you quietly in the corridors or in your office, we don't like what's going on, we know what they are doing but they will not raise their voice to defend the organization or, or uh, the Secretary General for that matter. At the same time, the Secretary General should not be intimidated by the fact that he may run afoul of, of uh, uh, US uh, uh, policy because the US also knows that there could be moments of uh, convergence and moments of disagreement. I mean, I recall conversations I've had with some of the secretaries of state, uh, with Madeleine Albright, where we, di we disagreed on quite a few things, or with the others, 
where he said, that's why you are the Secretary General, I'm the Secretary of State. I have my interest, I know what I'm defending, and you would, and there are times when they would also push hard. Uh, I think one at one time somebody told uh, the Secretary of State, I think it was Madeleine, that the lawyers have said this. Say, change your lawyers, get yourself better lawyers. <laughs> Which is, uh, uh, but I think the U.S. realizes that it needs a U.N. and the U.N. also needs a U.S. So the U.N. and the Secretary General should not always uh, behave as if they are helpless and they have no, uh, uh, no means to resist or to because the U.S. in the end also needs the U.N. Uh, I recall on Iraq, when they were talking about U.N. being irrelevant, and I said, be careful, you're going to need the U.N. after the war to help you try to stabilize. If you discredit the organization to the extent that you're doing, you won't be able to come back, or you have to come back with your tail between your legs. In the end, they did come. So the ups and downs will be there is part of the, of, of, of the function. Uh, uh, and I, I, I also think that the UN itself can do better explaining this position, not only to the American media, but to the people at large. We don't do a good job telling our story. We don't do a good job explaining our position. And we can't even tell our success stories effectively. Do you remember, Kofi, when Senator Jesse Helms yes. came to the UN Security Council, <laughs> yeah. um, brought by Ambassador Richard Holbrook, Holbrook who yes. worked long and hard yeah. to get the Senate to agree to a new disposition on UN finances. And Jesse Helms came to the Security Council and, and talked to the 15 states uh, around the horseshoe table. And I remember him saying, in the, in the heart of the politics of the United Nations, you people must realize there is no greater authority in international affairs than the voice of the American people. People, yeah, that, that, <laughs> <laughs> from the Security Council. No, it's true. And we were all far too polite. It went round 14 of us. And we wouldn't take him up on this until the last speaker in the Security Council was Ambassador Martin Anjaba of Namibia. Yeah, a revolutionary. <laughs> a revolutionary. He said, I've listened, Senator, very carefully to what you have said. To us, and I understand that the United States is the world's greatest democracy. But when Namibia was seeking independence and trying to create a democracy in its own state through the voice of its own people, you gave us no help whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> and there was a silence. <laughs> that was as eloquent as yeah, anything. Yeah, that is true. You see, this is also, as I said, often the member states don't speak up, but at least one person spoke up because he could have walked out thinking that it had laid down the law and nobody challenged me. Yeah. Strangely, he became a fan of the UN after that. Jesse oh, he invited me to his alma mater to give a speech, and he was sitting next to Nan, and I was on the podium, and he was fanning Nan. <laughs> I said, <laughs> a southern gentleman, I said, we've got a friend here. Uh, I'm going to come to a couple more questions from the audience, but I'm going to release a privilege for an unsubmitted question to anybody in the audience who's been a former permanent representative at the United Nations. <laughs> <laughs> because we have those from Sarah. Australia and India and the UK, maybe one or two others I haven't seen. So prepare yourselves in, in due course. But um, could I have the next question, please, from Judith Fawcett. Judith Fawcett from the United Nations Association in Belfast. Education is a powerful and precious right which should be delivered throughout the world to everyone. 
What message of encouragement and hope will you give to young people growing up in situations of conflict or its legacy mm -hmm. that make education impossible? Yeah. No, ed education is extremely important and precious, as you say. And I think we should try, okay, on that, with the Millennium Development Goals, we are pushing education, particularly for girls, in, the, in, in all societies. And in refugee situations, the High Commission for Refugees attempts to set up schools uh, in the camps to assist with education. Uh, I, I, and in Syria, the UNRWA, the UN program, which also runs a Palestinian territory in Gaza, is setting up schools in, in these camps in an attempt not only to educate them, but to maintain the hope and get across the message that education is so important. In whatever circumstances you are in, we will try to get education to you. It's not perfect, it's not ideal, it's not the circumstances that people would normally want to be in to be able to study. But since you cannot move them to the countries or back to their own country, you have to do the best you can where they are. But you have to tell them not to give up hope. And they are young people. You cannot talk in terms of hope. You have to act. You have to give them access to education. We need to find the means. And this is where the humanitarian work sometimes falls short because uh, we know the needs, but we don't get the money, the resources. I mean, if you take Syria, I think the UN has got less than half of the pledges or the needs that uh, it, it, it has. Right, would any former permanent representative wish to put a question? David Hannan. Well, it's an offer you make which is extremely unwise because both the permanent representatives sitting here would like to ask Kofi a question. <laughs> uh, I'd like to, to follow on what you said about Ukraine and Syria, yeah. where I would take a slightly more pessimistic view yeah. than you because I think that we do actually face a Cold War type paralysis in the UN machinery insofar as dealing with those two problems concerned. Mm -hmm. But could you perhaps look at the third Cold War paralysis situation, which is that in the East and South China Seas? Yeah. Uh, and what do you think that the UN could do uh, to get away from a situation which currently looks really rather threatening yeah. and in which uh, all the parties are deadlocked mm -hmm. And it's quite clear that if you simply went to the Security Council, you'd get a Chinese veto. Yeah. So could you perhaps say something about that further? Yeah. yeah. Let, 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 let me say that on, uh, on the uh, Cold War uh, situation. You, you, you are right that on Syria and on Ukraine, we seem blocked in the, we are blocked in the Council. But I'm hopeful that with a bit of persistent and quiet talk, one can break the Ukrainian situation. If, if we can, I don't know what happens after, what will happen with the elections and what happens with Russian attitude after the elections. They have indicated they are, they are waiting to see what happens. If we can get some understanding going and we break it there, and can put together a core group is all if in Syria, we may be able to disengage. And in fact, uh, Jeffrey Sachs just came out with a book on how to move the world, talking about the kind of engagement that took place between Khrushchev and Kennedy. The exchange of letters, quite extraordinary, very quietly working out to resolve the Cuban crisis and moving on to nuclear disarmament, uh, which using third parties, talking very quietly, surprising their own size, both of them. You know, and I would hope we will be able to work some of that quiet uh, diplomacy. Let me now turn to Asia. 
I think the Chinese situation is very uh, uh, difficult. I would want to see a situation where, given the fact that China is really trying to also woo the Asian countries, where Asian countries come together, uh, ASEAN plus, and try and engage the Chinese, because I don't think the Secretary General can do it. If he goes to the council, you're right, China will veto it. And uh, in the mood they are in, uh, they will not hesitate to do it. For quite a while, we had the feeling that the Chinese didn't want to assert power. They didn't even want to. Uh, they were a bit reticent in asserting their power on the international scene. But recently, they've been blatant. Uh, and uh, if the UN is not going to be able to be a forum for discussion on the uh, uh, crisis in the Asian seas, who should do it? I don't know if, I don't think ASEAN alone uh, could do it. Uh, they would need some encouragement. Unfortunately, uh, if you go beyond and you bring in powers like the US and others, China will not engage. Uh, and, and honestly, I don't see how we diffuse our situation apart from probably uh, getting the Chinese to understand that they are going to lose quite a lot of their neighbors. I mean, what is happening with Vietnam is a good sign and a good warning uh, for them. But of course, they are in such a dominant economic position that they believe nobody in the region can take them on. But if they did it collectively, it will have an impact. But how do you put that group, collective group together to confront China? Mm -hmm. John, John Douth, I extend the privilege to any professors of KCL who would like to ask a question. <laughs> Secretary General, um, uh, welcome to London. Uh, as you'll know, uh, all the time I was PR in New York, uh, yeah. I was uh, even in this room of great, great fans, uh, uh, one of your very greatest fans. But we've not always been as lucky uh, in uh, Secretaries General we've had over the 60 whatever it is years. Uh, and uh, we're starting to think in terms of your successor's successor. Mm -hmm. uh, people are already beginning to talk about candidates. Uh, I wonder what thoughts you might have about the way in which the international community in New York might uh, uh, maximise the prospects um, of uh, producing another Secretary General like yourself, sir. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's an awkward question. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think there's been lots of... Uh, a discussion on this issue and how one should go about uh, selecting uh, a secretary general. There are those who believe that it, it should be a much more open process and uh, that this system should move away from the regional rotation. I don't think that's going to be possible. It's, it's established. Uh, but even if it has to be a regional rotation, do you have to sit back and only look at candidates produced by governments and supported by governments? Or the organization itself can also do a search, indicate the sort of qualities that is looking for the type of person. Because even if they did a search and identify somebody uh, and the governments came up with another person, they've established a standard. This is the sort of person we want. Uh, will that happen? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, can we get the governments to agree that um, they will themselves raise the standards when they are looking at candidates? And I think they, they can do it. I recall about eight years ago, the Chinese are telling me in Beijing, you're going to see a difference in the quality of people we send out. Mm -hmm. And it did change. Okay. It did change. They, they made a conscious decision, and they have some very good people uh, out. 
which means a government can do it. If they, how do we challenge them to do it in this situation? I don't know, but I think we should have a much bigger pool uh, to select from. Then you'll be interested to hear that UNA UK are mm. starting, about to start a campaign mm -hmm. uh, to uh, argue for a much more open process, process. Yeah. and a meritocratic process mm -hmm. for the election of the Secretary General yeah, that's good. Uh, that moves on and maybe it's in the face of realism. Mm. But I think that this programme yeah. Uh, ought to start a, a debate about it. This is a very and good We had idea. to talk about it at the UN Forum, amongst, uh, amongst other places. It's uh, Crispin. Uh, Crispin Tikal. You pass the microphone through to the back. Thank you. Uh, Crispin Tikal, a former British Good. permanent representative of the United Nations. Now, one aspect of United Nations activities has been singularly unsuccessful so far. I remember that when I was there, I once raised the, in the Security Council the question of how flooding might be a political issue. And the mm -hmm. representative of Brazil said, no, no, we're all concerned here with politics but not, and war, not, not flooding. Well, what we're now realizing, following the last report of the United Nations uh, report, the, the latest United Nations report on it, that we're seeing the prospect of substantial climatic disruptions all over the world, mm -hmm. including, and above, perhaps above all, in Africa, mm -hmm. in which an African country can find, find itself deprived of water or flooded with refugees or suffering from extreme drought. Now, at the moment, UNEP, as the United Nations body responsible, does its, I think, rather humble best. Yeah. But I'd like to think that the United Nations as a whole took a much stronger interest and perhaps could create appropriate institutions for the purpose to look into the environmental, environmental implications and the political implications mm -hmm. of what is now going on all around us. It would be a follow-up to the latest um, in, in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and many other documents that have been produced. So I'd just be grateful to know whether you think something more should be done to strengthen the United Nations role and make yeah. people a bit bolder and ready to act and call for action. Yeah. No, no I agree with you that we, we need to do much more. And in fact, Secretary General Ban has made uh, climate change one of his personal priorities and is uh, uh, pushing for action. But all the areas you mentioned, you are absolutely uh, right, with the floods or what one is beginning to call situations that lead to environmental migrants, you know, uh, which we are not looking at seriously. And we not only should New York be thinking about it, the High Commissioner for Refugees should be look, looking at this. And I hope that this, the work the Secretary General and his team is doing includes the issues you've raised. And next year, in, when they meet in Paris and prepare a document, these aspects would also be, be, be looked at because it, 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 it is real. People have tended to think climate change is remote, but we are seeing this impact all around. And I think what is also important, and we talked about civil society earlier. I have a feeling on the climate change issue, we need to mobilize civil society uh, for them to work with the UN and get the governments to take uh, action, you know, uh, individually and collectively on these issues. A final question from Professor Matt Sperdow. Kofi, I was just, is that working? Yeah, I, I was wondering, you know, there's been uh, quite a deal of criticism from African countries about mm -hmm. the way in which the International Criminal Court mm -hmm. has actually operated. And this, of course, is a, mm -hmm. a great achievement and something you promoted. Um, do, you, do you accept and do you see some of the criticisms and, and is it something that wasn't properly yeah. foreseen in yeah. terms of the politicization of the court and the use perhaps by the Security Council of referrals, yeah. preventing uh, progress in, 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 in yeah. resolution of conflicts? No, the, the, uh, 
superficially, the African governments have a point that only African cases are being trialed by the court. Uh, I often try to remind them that uh, there have been other cases, but there were special courts. There were special courts for the Yugoslav crisis, special court for Cambodia, and of course we have special court for Sierra Leone. So there have been other situations of uh, international justice since Nuremberg. Uh, and um, above all, the cases, the African cases before the court were submitted by the Africans themselves. In the case of the Kenyan, uh, Kenyan government, they promised to cooperate. In fact, they were given an opportunity to set up a local tribunal to bring to book those who were responsible for these uh, attacks. Twice the parliament turned it down and uh, before it went to the ICC. They also have to accept that if the African courts were competent and able to trial these cases, there will be no need for the ICC. The attack on the ICC often in Africa is coming from the leadership, not from the victims. And when you ask the leaders, since you're banding together pro to protect yourself and to speak for yourself, who speaks for the victims? How do they get justice? I haven't got an answer from uh, 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 any of them. But I think the ICC uh, itself as it looks at the, the cases that it has under review, should, um, it shouldn't be contrived. If they have cases from outside Africa, it will help them to have one or two other cases from outside Africa, and that will diffuse the sense that uh, uh, it's only Africans. But I can tell you, civil society and the victims are very happy that for the first time, in, in, the, in African judiciary history, prominent people are being brought to account and impunity is being challenged. And that's the steps the leaders. I'd like now to invite onto the stage Edward Mortimer to come and join us for 10 minutes or so. Uh, because Edward, as uh, Kathy Annan's speech writer and director of communications throughout his period as Secretary General, has made a huge contribution yes, to yeah. the book that we're here to launch yeah. and to uh, pick up and, and celebrate. Uh, and uh, that contribution uh, was, was enormous, as I saw oh, yeah. myself. And there was a question from uh, Emanuele Militello. Uh, Emanuele, are you in the room? Yeah. Uh, uh. Yes, you are here now. Uh, I'm now coming to your question because it's about communication. So let's have it in your mouth. I was told you weren't in the room. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Anu Militello. I'm from the UCL branch of UNA Youth. My question is, one of the United Nations' greatest challenges has been to bridge the impossibly wide gap between its goals for a fair and peaceful world and its capacities to achieve this. This has led to many people of becoming cynical about the organization and its accomplishments to date. How can the UN try to change this image through better communication or otherwise? Thank you. Now, Edward, do you want to give Kofi a break and first go <laughs> about, uh, about that question? Bless the board. Yeah. Well, can that, we... is, that is the question, of course, that uh, we were constantly grappling with. Um, in the team uh, around Kofi uh, during, during those years. And it will be, continue to be the question, I think, for every Secretary General and every UN official, really. Um, the, the UN <coughs> is set up with very grand ambitions set out in the Charter, and particularly in the preamble to the Charter. But it is an association of member states, and all of those member states, you know, the, basically headed by governments who consider it as their first priority to look after national interests. One of the things that uh, Kofi used to, often to say when he was Secretary General was that you've got to understand that the global interest is the national interest. And I think, I mean, a very good example of this would be the whole question of sustainability and climate yeah. change. I mean, that 
the idea that some nations are going to be all right while others suffer the consequences of climate change is just ridiculous. So, I mean, these are the kind of points, I think, that the UN has, has to put across, that even though, take for perhaps at the moment it would be the United States uh, you know, as the largest uh, emitter of carbon, uh, you know, that it would not be in your interest or you think that you should wait until China and India and other countries are uh, willing to take the same measures. The idea that you would somehow be gaining from letting this happen uh, is, is just crazy. It's, you've got to look further ahead and you've got to look <coughs> more broadly at what the national interest really means in the 21st century. There's still the, the question, Kofi, about effective communications yeah. by and from the UN. And the UN associations around the world, and, and I hope that mm -hmm. the one in the UK plays its part, yeah. uh, tries to pick up some of the gaps in communication yeah. that have been left by perhaps a, a not a universal so, yeah. communications effort yeah. by the UN. Are you disappointed by that? Yeah, no, f f first of all, uh, organizations like yours are extremely helpful, but we need to work much more effectively with you. The UN needs to work much more effectively with you uh, on, 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 on these issues. You talk of gaps, sometimes the gaps are so huge that it is uh, because we are not putting uh, our views uh, uh, across. I think we have to start, um, yes, we, we, we give hope to people, we encourage them to dream, but we also have to start by reducing expectations as to what the UN as an organization can do and cannot do. Because we sometimes allow, we set ourselves up by either making statements or embracing actions which implies we can do everything and it's patently not possible and then when we fail it's a great letdown for the public and the and we don't explain what it is that we are trying to do and the resources we have within what the constraints are we have to find some effective ways of doing it there's also, in my judgment, Edward, you were in, in media once, that the media often also confuses the issue. In the UN, it's in a very difficult situation to clarify it. We often talk of the UN, but, but there are two UNs, in my judgment. The UN of the member states who sit on the Council, General Assembly, Human Rights, and give us the mandates and the UN, that is a secretariat, led by the Secretary General. When things go wrong, and the press say, the UN, which UN are they talking about? The Secretary General? Even when it's about an issue where effective action can only be taken if the member states come together, US, Russia, and others, and act, is the UN, and in the minds of most people, is a bureaucracy, you know, and, and it gives the member states a pass, and they don't really, uh, and it's important, I recall, uh, I, I asked President Clinton once, how come the congressmen say all these things, vote the way they do in, in Congress and the Senate, and uh, they get away with it? said, because if they go to their constituencies, nobody asks them about the UN. Yeah. Nobody challenges them, nobody explains. So I think some of these uh, anomalies also need to be sorted out so that we can communicate if effectively uh, and um, uh, try and do something about what we, explain what we are about. You still <clears throat> itching to get back into support of the UN and do you think that, uh, that there are things that, that could be said that are not being said about the effectiveness of the UN? Well, I think one has to be very careful if one works in the Secretariat, not, not to get into a kind of blame game. I mean, it's the sort of, in a way, the easy reaction, 
Uh, it wasn't us, Gov, it was the member states, you know. Uh, um, well, the fact is that it is an organisation of member states. The Secretariat is set up to serve the member states. But, I mean, I think what was important about Kofi's vision of what it meant to be Secretary General was that he could remind the governments yeah. that, you know, we the peoples is not the same as we the governments. Yeah. And um, you are there, you represent your peoples, but you are not the ultimate authority. And the communications revolution, which had happened, or had begun to happen at least, by the time when he became Secretary General in 1997, yeah meant that there was beginning to be something called, which one could call at least, world public opinion. Yeah. Uh, and so that um, it was possible, I mean, it was very, very, yeah. had to be done very carefully, because for all the reasons you were talking about, you can't have, for instance, the Secretary General kind of permanently at odds with a leading member exactly. state like the US. But you could, to some extent, yeah. make governments feel that they had to look over their shoulder because there might sometimes be, yeah. Yeah. of course, and I think you alluded to it in the case of the International Criminal Court. Yes. These African governments should think, uh, do we actually have our peoples behind us yeah. when we attack the ICC? I suppose you could say it's a bit discouraging that they, the Kenyans elected two people yeah. who have been indicted yeah. by the court uh, as president and vice president. But I think the broader point is still valid that yeah the Secretary General and the people working with the Secretary General can yeah. remind governments by appealing beyond them yeah. uh, to world yeah. public opinion. You and certainly that is, did that yeah. in, in your yeah. approach. Did exactly. you get the feedback? I, I, I got, when I started at the beginning, some countries were unhappy about pulling in civil society, the private sector, and sort of raise the question of where did the Secretary General get the mandate uh, to do this? And my answer was, uh, look at the Charter. It starts with we, the peoples. And the peoples are out there, not in the glass house. Mm -hmm. So we need to reach out to them and to work with them. Some were also worried, and they were right, that uh, we use civil society to put pressure on them. And they were not comfortable about that. Uh, and I recall uh, when we began, we attempted to reach out to parliaments. It got worse. <laughs> we, shouldn't go, we shouldn't go to parliaments uh, uh, to talk to them. But uh, the, the whole idea was also to bring in uh, the peoples who would be able to work with us and get the message across to their own governments which was easier for them than for us. And honestly, there were certain things we did at the UN that we couldn't have done without civil society. You know, I mean, sometimes you may criticize them by seeing them as a flame through us, but they opened the door. They opened the door. One of the things that has come through very strongly to UNA UK yeah. from our supporters around the country, particularly from young people, yeah. is that the UN represents yeah. the principles of global legitimacy. Yeah. Governments do not yeah. uh, represent mm -hmm. legitimacy in that sense mm -hmm. of having principles and norms and conventions and charters that the majority of global citizens res respect. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a very important part of the yeah. strength of the UN in the 21st century when some of its mechanisms are getting a bit old and, yeah. and creaky. We still find that to be a very real... Uh, and necessary um, strength of the, of the UN. No, that, 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 that is good. And to hold on to the next generation and let them have faith in the UN, faith in the principles that we, we stand for, I think is extremely important. But it's not enough for us. We tend to do it through model UNs and the work uh, you do. We need to find a way of making sure it's really part of education curricula. But also the UN will have to find ways and means of getting governments to, and the peoples to live up to this. We, we started with human rights. If, if we are seen to be patently doing better on human rights, it's, it's a plus. 
on the climate change, if we can really have a movement to get the young and everyone involved. I keep telling them, as individuals and as young people, they have power. They have power through the choices they make, what they buy, whom they vote for, and the pressure they put on politicians to get the climate change agenda higher up in priorities. Uh, and if we can mobilize them and get them to engage and feel that they are not only being useful, but they are also working for these principles they believed in, we'll be building a very strong base of support for the organization. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, we've had an hour that we could extend for a long time, I think, to go through the various issues in front of uh, the United Nations. Uh, you have a book to pick up this afternoon and to read carefully again because you will know many of the speeches. Uh, but you've had the opportunity this afternoon to converse directly or indirectly uh, with one of the UN's most distinguished servants uh, over its 70 years and we will be celebrating the UN's 70th birthday in this country uh, next year. Uh, with much vigour. Uh, thank you, Kofi, for being with us this afternoon. And I would like this audience to express to you uh, the huge gratitude that we feel for your service to the United Nations and to global issues. And may you long continue in your excellent work. Thank, thank you, you both very much. Thank you. Thank you.